Hi, welcome to Tech Talks DevOps Edition. Thanks for your patience, we'll begin shortly. Um, you'll be able to submit your questions in the Q&A section and the conversation will continue uh, within the community.splunk.com. This webinar will be recorded and shared with all the attendees. Uh, we'll just wait another minute to uh, let the rest of the attendees uh, get logged in and then we'll begin. Welcome to Tech Talks. Our DevOps edition today is focused on Splunk synthetic monitoring. Tech Talks is a series of short webinars that are deep dives for technical practitioners. We value you, our customer, and want you to continue in your Splunk journey. Our experts help create these best practices, and we want you to leverage them in your daily role. Today, I'm, we're very fortunate to have uh, Carl Seppel from uh, TechStream joining us. And he's going to share information with you about our focus area, um, de DevOps and observability. With that, uh, Carl, uh, I'm going to hand this over to you. Pleasure to have you. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Yeah, so today, uh, as promised, we're going to try to keep this technical and not have a whole lot of salesy stuff and PowerPoint presentations. We're going to jump into the demo pretty quickly here, but just a few slides to kind of set the stage. A little bit about TechStream and, and where I come from. Um, TechStream, TechStream has been in existence for about 12 years and I've been with them for almost 10 of those years. And we really focus on four S's. Um, the first is sales. So we are a software license reseller for Splunk and other vendors. The second is services, we're a professional services organization. Splunk is our biggest practice, but we also do AWS, cloud services, Oracle and others as well. Support is a big part of our business as well. So we don't want to leave customers hanging and you know, walk in, do the implementation and then leave and they're on their own. So we like to provide that, that support after the installation and after the services work. So we have a variety of support offerings available um, from a retainer base to ad hoc on demand as you need it. And then sourcing or staffing. Uh, we have a very, very robust recruiting arm to the company that focuses on technical IT uh, staffing. So if you are in need of a person that knows how to do Splunk that you want to hire on full time or other IT areas as well. Uh, we do a lot of that. So those are the four S's and a little bit about TechStream. So real quick run through on the agenda. Uh, we'll talk about what the problem statement is. You know, what does Splunk Synthetics, um, or I'll just call it Synthetics, what, does, what, what problems does it help you solve? And so we'll, we'll talk about the problem statement. We'll jump into how we can actually use Splunk Synthetic Monitoring to solve and help you dive in on some of those things. And then the all important demo, try to focus as much as we can on the demo time, provide opportunities for you guys to ask questions. As David said, there's a Q and A panel. You can enter your questions throughout the presentation there. Uh, they'll get queued up. Uh, some of them may be answered directly with you. Others we will try to do verbally, but we will get to every question. If we run out of time in today's presentation, we will get back to you one-on-one -on -one, uh, with answers to your questions uh, after the presentation is done. And then we'll also give you some links and everything uh, to we have places to find additional information. We'll go over that at, at the end as well. And there'll be a copy of the presentation you know, made available. We are recording this. So you don't have to worry about trying to scribble down all the links and, and things like that. So what's, what's the problem? What is it that Splunk Synthetics likes to do? What is it good at? And it's really focused around performance issues on websites. Uh, there are some things that we do with APIs, particularly REST APIs, and I'll show you that when we get into the demo as well. But at its core, it's really focused around you know, HTTP, HTTPS websites, looking at performance of those sites. It's not an APM type situation where it's looking at individual pages and the performance of little bits of those pages and things like that. It's really uh, a, a holistic solution that looks at those from a web or from a, from a high level perspective. Websites are very complex. You know, you guys use them every day. You know, they're they're an integral part of our life these days. Whether it's ordering stuff on Amazon or doing research and Googling things to find answers to questions, or all sorts of things in between, we all use you know websites a lot, and they get more complex as the days go on. And so, being able to tell you know is my website up and running? You know, it's, if, if I'm an e-commerce vendor, for example, I need to make sure that my site is up and running. I need to make sure that it's responding in a quick manner. 
Um, I need to monitor things like uptime. I need to be able to do, um, you know, simulate user traffic, things like that, that to help me understand what my end user's experience is. Because I can be looking at the back end all day long and I can have all sorts of metrics and statistics and traces and spans and all sorts of things telling me that my servers are looking good and you know my network is running fine and all these kinds of things. But ultimately, if that end user experience in the browser is not good, that's what matters to the users. They don't care how fast my servers are. They don't care that my servers are up. If the website's not performing in a quick manner that they expect, you're going to lose business. So how do we monitor that? How do we measure that? Uh, and then, as I said, what about REST APIs? Can we do anything to, to similarly you know, manage and er, monitor and manage those as well? So Splunk Synthetic Monitoring is really made up of three types of tests. And we're going to walk through all three of those when we get into the demo, the demo portion. The first one that I want to talk about a, a little bit is uptime test. Uh, this is a very basic test of a page that says, is it up? Is it down? How is it performing? You know, Home page would be a great example here, or maybe your login page, or maybe um, you know the search page. If I was Google, how is that page performing? Is it up? Is it down? You know, obviously, I don't want to have it be down if I'm if I'm going to lose traffic. So it's a basic test. Uh, it does do more than just HTTP and HTTPS, and we'll look at that. Uh, it does not parse the website. It does not run the JavaScript things like that. Uh, it's really looking at, you know, there's load times and there's other metrics and things that we'll look at in the demo. Some of the key ones you can see are the measures. Uh, response time, obviously very, very important. It does look at things like DNS time. It does look at time to first byte. There's other metrics and things. Those are kind of the, the top three that uh, I thought were important, but we'll, we'll walk through that. So that's basic uptime test. Then we have browser tests. And this is a more intensive way of testing out a multi-step process that a user might go through on your website. So best example of this is an e-commerce website, and that's the one we're going to look at today. User logs in, they might browse around, look at various things, add them to their shopping cart. At some point, hopefully they click the checkout button, fill in some information, uh, hopefully give me, my, give me their credit card information, and we send them the product. Uh, that's a lot of steps to go through. They may have to log in to do something if you require an account for, for your users, uh, things like that. And so, the browser-based test inside of SSM is focused around those multi-step processes. And we can group those steps together into what we call transactions. So for example, the login process may be two or three steps. You know, First, you go to a page and it asks you for your username, you click next, then it asks you for your password, you click submit, it does some other things, and you know, so it may be a multiple, multiple steps within that particular transaction. We'll talk a little bit about Selenium. Uh, for those of you that have used Selenium in the past, it's an open source tool that lets you script uh, browser-based testing. Um, I, you know, I've encountered it for probably the last 20 years of my career, so it's been around a long time. Um, there is some similarities between what Splunk Synthetics does, particularly the browser test, and Selenium. Uh, and in fact, we'll even talk about some integration points there. One thing that we'll see in the demo is the nice thing is Splunk Synthetics records these tests. So we can actually see what's happening as we progress through these steps. And again, we'll see all this in the demo, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on it here. But sometimes a picture is truly worth a thousand words. And you know, being able to see, oh, that's the error message that came up, or that's the way the screen rendered or didn't render, or things like that, sometimes just being able to see it is really, really important. Some of the measures that the browser test uh, will give us, we've, we've got test level results. So did, did it succeed or fail? Were we able to run through all the steps successfully or not? How many times did we run? What's the average duration? All those kinds of things. We've got page level metrics that we gather, page performance, the web vitals, uh, the Google web vitals, if you're familiar with those, all sorts of information around connections, um, content, you know, size, time frame, all those types of things. And then the individual transactions. So as, as most of you probably know, a web page is made up of multiple objects multiple requests, each image on the page is a request, each little snippet of JavaScript is a request. So we gather those at the transaction level as well. The third type of test that SSM does is API test. And so this is REST only, it does not support SOAP, but just REST API calls. And much like with a browser-based test, um, we can have multiple steps here. So we can make a call to an API, get results back, we can actually analyze the results or do things with the results and then use that in subsequent steps, uh, much like with browser tests. So it's 
pretty much like browser test, except it's a REST API is what we're hitting on the back end, not an actual website. As with the browser base, we get metrics collected at multiple levels here, the run level stuff, the request level, um, similar. Globally, so all three types of tests uh, have these common features. SSM has uh, currently, last time I checked, it was over 50 locations worldwide that they run these tests from. Um, a year ago, it was like 22 uh, when I looked you know, a little bit, a little while ago. So it's definitely grown. And so, so you can actually simulate a test from all over the world. You want to test what your users in Germany are experiencing, great. You want to test what your users in Virginia are experiencing, great. California, great. Uh, so you can set up and pick which of these test locations you want to run your various tests from. Obviously, performance could be different in different regions, or some regions you may have problems that you don't have in others. Uh, for example, some countries may block some of the traffic, and they may not even be able to get to your website. So those are good things to know. What I really love about SSM is the ability to create private locations. And this is a, uh, basically you download an image, and it runs in Docker, so it will run on pretty much any device you can think of, but you could have a, a, a Docker a host running inside of your environment, download this image, run this image, you set up the tests and everything through SSM, and it actually reaches uh, down into your organization and runs the tests from that private location. So even if you want to test REST APIs and browser uh, you know, websites that aren't publicly available outside of your firewall, you have the ability to do that. So just set up a private location and select that when you're going through the test setup and I'll show you where that is and it will run that test in that private location. And so I've been able to do that with some customers that again have a very specific constraints. Um, a particular customer that I'm thinking of, the site is available publicly, but when you log in, uh, they use Okta for their, their SAML provider, they actually have it restricted based on IP address. So even though I can bring the web page up, if I try to log in, it won't let me log in unless I'm on a specific IP address. They're not going to open that up to the 50 locations that Splunk has for, for the public site, uh, test sites. So we set up a private location uh, internally that has a you know, static IP address that they can then whitelist and allow us to run these tests for them. All these tests have the ability to do global variables. I mentioned a little bit of you know, uh, programming, if you will. Um, as you're running through the scripts with the API and the browser one in particular, you can you know, capture data that comes back and use that, set that in a variable. You can actually run JavaScript as part of the test if you need to manipulate that, and we'll see that in the demo. All these are schedulable. You can decide how often they run, what locations they run. You can round robin. From, you know, if you've got 10 different locations you've picked, you can say every five minutes run it, and it will just round robin each of those 10 locations, or you can say run it at all 10 every five minutes or every two minutes or every hour, whatever you want to do. Lots of dashboarding, we'll see that. And since this is part of the Splunk Observability Cloud Suite, it's now a module within that suite. You've got full integration with other products, such as ROM, which is real user monitoring. Uh, if you're not familiar with ROM, that's basically application performance management. If you're familiar with APM on the back end that measures your server performance, ROM actually monitors and reports back on performance within the page, within the user's browser. So we find that Splunk Synthetics and ROM actually tie hand in hand very, very closely. It's kind of like you, you start with Synthetics, if you need to dive in deeper, you go to RUM. If you need to dive in deeper, you can then pull, pull in some of the other modules and components, such as APM or infrastructure monitoring. So enough of the slides. Let's jump into the demo. All right. So I'll give it just a second to sync up here. Hopefully, you guys are seeing a uh, dark screen that says Splunk Synthetics up in the top left-hand corner. Um, if you're not seeing that, uh, David or someone, if you, if you could just let me know to, to confirm there, but it looks like it's sharing out. So this, if you haven't seen Splunk Observability Cloud, this, this is the Splunk Observability Cloud um, user interface. There's a lot of things here, um, various modules that are included with Splunk Observability Cloud are listed down the left-hand side here. So you can see APM, Application Performance Monitoring, Infrastructure Monitoring, Log Observer, RUM, we talked about Splunk Synthetics. There's a couple other modules that aren't shown here, uh, but they will show up on the left-hand side here. But we're going to jump into Splunk Synthetics, and we see a list of um, uh, test jobs that have been set up. And I'm just going to filter this down to, to ones that we've set up for this demo um, and, and walk through some of these. 
So you can see across the top, we've got our filters. By default, it's showing me all, but I can say only show me the browser tests, only show me the API tests, or only show me the uptime test. So I've got the ability to, to filter those. And you can see you know, what type of a test it is, the name, when it was last run, whether it's running or not. This is a little bit scary when you do a demo and you see things like this because it should be running all the time. Um, how many locations it's running from. Detectors, we'll talk about that in just a minute um, and when it was last updated. But we're going to walk through um, creating a new test. And I'm going to do the, the simplest one first, which is the uptime test. And you can see we can choose whether we want to do HTTP or a port. So we can do HTTP, which is over TCP, or we can actually sp specify an individual port. And those can be TCP or UCP. A UDP, uh, and so if you just want to test, is something responding on this port? You can do that as well with Splunk, synth Splunk Synthetics. I'm going to go in and, cre and create a, an HTTP test. So this is just testing if my my website is up or down. Um, and I'll walk you through the fields here. We've got a name for the test, obviously. We've got the ability to do different types of um, requests to that website. The most typical being a get, that's typically what your browser will do, but we can also simulate posts, put patch delete, all, all sorts of things. But in the URL that I want to test here, and I do have the ability to customize my request headers. Uh, so if, if the particular web page is looking for a specific header or um, you know, something that's needed there, I can certainly customize that if I want to. I've got the ability to do um, authentication. Uh, we do have uh, these tokens are basically uh, variables talk about that um, in one of the other tests when we walk through that. I can do basic authentication. Uh, if I want to do you know, form-based authentication, things like that, then I need to look at one of the other options, particularly the browser test. The uptime test doesn't have the ability to do the scripting and multi-steps and all those kinds of things. Uh, skipping over a couple of these, again, I can specify my user agent. So if I want to simulate that I'm coming from you know, an iOS uh, you know, browser versus an Android browser versus you know, a Windows machine or running Microsoft Edge or something like that, I've got the ability to, to control that user um, agent. The locations, uh, this is where we, we tell it where to run. And you can see there's a lot of uh, test ones in here in this demo environment. But all these that say AWS, um, these are the default ones that, that come out of the box. And again, you can set up your own private location. So you can see we do have locations located all around the world. Um, you know, basically corresponding to the AWS regions, if you're familiar with the AWS environment. How often I want it to run, you can see I've got a lot of options there from a minute to every day, whether I want to do round robin or whether I want to do it simultaneously from all of my test locations, um, and then I can activate it or not. Detectors, what's a detector? Uh, this is uh, the Splunk Observability Cloud's uh, term for an alert, basically. So with a detector, I can come in here and uh, I can set up an alert that will fire whenever something happens. And so, for example, here, uh, and I love how they kind of walk you through this. I want to be alerted when. It's, it's a very uh, a, a nice way to walk through it. So the HTTP test, I haven't given it a name yet, so I get a little funky variable there. But I want, what, what do I want to check? The duration, how, you know, how long did it take me to actually pull up that web page? Uh, how long did it take to get the first byte? Um, whether it was up or down. So maybe I just want to report whatever it goes down. Um, and then I've got, depending on what I pick, I've got a variety of thresholds that I can pick here. And I can actually scope this down to, to various keys. Uh, we won't go through that in this particular demo, but I've got the ability to filter that a little bit. And then since this is a simple static threshold, you know, in this case, I can say if, if the run duration takes longer than five seconds, um, if it happens once, then let me know. I can say maybe it has to happen two times in a row, three times in a row. So how quickly do I want to get notified there? And do I want to be notified um, when it's across different locations or across all locations? And so I, I, the default is to split by locations. And what I love about this is it actually goes back and it shows you, in this case, it's going back, I think it's three or four days, and showing me that for this particular test, and in this case, it's a new test, I haven't actually run it yet, so there's no data to show here. Um, but if I can bring up one of the other ones, it actually shows me the data for the previous time period, and it will estimate if I was to click save and set a, an alert at this level, five, milli, five uh, seconds in this case, how many alerts would I have gotten? And in this case, it's saying zero in four days, again, because there's no data, but I'll show you one that's actually run. What do I want to do? Is this a critical alert? Is this just an informational alert? 
who do I want to send it to? Where do I want to send it to? You can see we've got integrations with a lot of different tools. There's others available. These are the most common ones. You know, email probably the the, the most uh, common one. But, uh, we can we can send it to Microsoft Teams. We can send it to um, you know Slack, and through the webhook, we can basically send it anywhere. Um, we do have integration with Incidents Intelligence. Uh, Incident Intelligence is Splunk's new name for Splunk on Call. Um, so if you're familiar with that, which used to be called Victor Ops, um, we do have full integration with that. Again, since we're running as part of the Splunk Observability Cloud Suite, we've got full integration there. All right, so that's a basic browser test. I'm going to bring up one and show you here, just so you can see what the results look like of one that's actually running. And so. On the dashboard, uh, we show how things we're doing. And in this case, uh, we are showing the run duration is the pink number. And so we can see for the last day, the last eight days, the last 30 days, so a couple of different time frames, And we can control whether what metrics we want to show here. So in this case, we're showing the run duration. It looks like it's been averaging about 24 seconds, which seems really, really long to me. Uh, the first byte time, so that's how long it takes to get that first byte back from that web page. Um, again, a, a rather long, almost 700 milliseconds. And then how long does it take before the web page can actually start to render? Uh, so those are the three metrics that we show, but we can control that. We can pick different metrics. You can see here, there's a lot of different options that we gather. First paint, paint time, first meaningful, first contentful paint time, um, which I always struggle with to say that. Uh, Google Web Vitals, if you're familiar with those, we gather those informations, we gather scores. Um, availability, uptime, up so a lot of different options that we have that we can we can graph here. Uptime trends, so again, showing the last day, eight days and 30 days, we can see very quickly, it looks like this site's only up about 80% of the time for some reason. Digging a little bit deeper, we can come down into here and we can go through and look at different time frames. Um, we can pick specific locations, so if we only wanted to look at whatever the particular metric was, in this case, it's run duration, we can filter only to specific locations. In this case, we're showing all locations. By default, it's splitting them out. Um, each location is split out into a different one, but if I wanted to, I could segment it by something else or nothing at all if I wanted to. And you can see here these red Xs. So whenever a test fails, it shows up as a red X. Whenever it succeeds, then it shows up you know, with these colored dots. And in this case, the, uh, the colored dot um, is indicating which location it's coming from. So the red ones are Tokyo, the green ones are Sydney, uh, the, the pink ones are Mumbai. So you can, you know, hopefully start to see in this case, it's kind of seems to be jumbled all over the place. But if there were trends, if a particular location in, in the world consistently performed better or slower than other ones, you could start to see uh, some of those trends here. And again, we can pick what, what metrics we want to show here, what locations we want to show, and how far back. We can also go in and look at specific runs. So for example, the last run was literally two minutes ago from Mumbai, took about 28 seconds. Uh, that particular one failed. So let's take a look at that one. And what we see across the top, the most important thing we see is this red bar. And this tells us right off the top, what was the problem? Um, and so in this case, it was looking for, and this is actually a browser test, not an uptime test, which we haven't really talked about just yet, but this was looking for some text that says your order and it timed out in step number two. Again, as I said, the really nice thing is we get this film strip and we can see as the test progressed, and in this case, it's a multi-step test, which I'll show you how we set one of those up in a minute. We can see as it progressed through the steps, what the user is seeing. So we're simulating that traffic from a browser um, to, to that website. And so we can you know, click on this and get you know, see exactly what the web page looked like when, when that particular point of the test occurred. We can click the play button here if we want to play it back in real time. We can actually see what was going on there. Um, it shows us what transactions, again, we haven't talked about the transactions and the steps and things within that. And then it shows us this nice waterfall, which I, I really love this chart. As we talked about, you know, a web page is made up of a lot of different elements. So in this particular case, we're looking at the, uh, the cart page. And we're seeing, you know, there's the, the basic get of the page, and then there's all these CSS and JavaScript and SVG images, and there's a lot of different elements that make up the page. And we can see how long it takes and what the response time is for those different elements. So for example, for this JPEG right here, uh, we can see that um, the request took five hundredths of a millisecond to send it. 
Uh, the time to first byte, which is when we started getting data back from the server, was 268 milliseconds. And it took a little over one second to actually download the content. And we can see it was a little over 200K. Um, so is that good? Is that bad? We, that's up, up to analysis. We can see the response code. So 200s are OK. Um, if we saw you know, 400 or 500, those would certainly be a problem. Um, so let me go back to the test. Uh, again, that was a browser test. Um, let me go into one of the just the uptime test. And again, this is the more simpler ones. We can see, in this case, the website's been up 100%, which is great. Our run durations seem to be all over the place. Uh, you know, sometimes it's really, really fast, and sometimes it's not so fast. Um, again, as with the browser test, we can see that the test uh, responses from different locations around the world. We can control what metrics we show, and we can see the individual uh, test results. In this case, since it's, since, since it's a simple um, uptime test, we don't get all of the, the, you know, the waterfall and the multiple steps and things like that. Um, we can just see basic information. It took 319 milliseconds to run this. Um, DNS took 12 of those. We can see you know, the, the request that was sent, the headers and the body. We can see the response that came back. We can see information about the negotiation. So since this was an HTTPS page, uh, it was protected with SSL, um, we can see all the details of the negotiation. So as it was negotiating TLS version 1.3 handshake, we can see the details of that. We can see the certificate that the uh, server is using. So this particular one was signed by GoDaddy. Um, so we can see basic information, but again, with a, a basic uptime test, uh, you just basically get it's, it's up and it responded or it didn't. Um, let's walk through um, the browser-based one again, and I'll use that same Buttercup store one that we were looking at, but now let's go into edit mode and actually see you know, what, what, what's it like to actually set one of these up or edit one of these. Um, as with the uptime test, we've got some basic information, the name, the URL, things like that. But you'll notice we now have this steps section here kind of uh, towards the top of the screen. Um, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. The rest of the screen is, is, again, very similar to what we saw with the uptime test. We've got which locations. A little bit more here in that we can now say what type of device do we want to simulate. So do we want to simulate the, the screen size of an iPad or an iPhone or, or Samsung Galaxy or a desktop browser? So we can set that viewport size, which again, you know, websites respond differently to different size screens. Um, so we've got that ability now that we didn't have with the uptime test. Uh, most of the other stuff is pretty similar. We do have the ability to do cookies. Again, with a basic uptime, it's just hitting a site and returning a response. In this case, since we're going from place to place, page to page, sometimes we get cookies back. So if we needed to add a cookie that was not provided to kind of to simulate a user returning to our site. So when they return, they may already have a cookie in their browser that gets presented that lets the, the website know that, hey, this is Carl coming back to your site. We can add those. And as before, we've got the ability to do the detectors. So let's take a look at these steps. So in this case, we've got uh, three transactions. The first transaction is navigate to store. The second one is add to cart. And the third one is complete order. And within each of these transactions, we can have multiple steps. Um, and the transactions are just way to just logical ways to group them together. So in these steps, we, we give each step a name. So in this particular one, I'm going to just say go to URL, and I'm going to just go to my my home page. And just for reference, this is the website that we're actually hitting. Um, it's a fake uh, e-commerce website. You, know, you can go through and click around and look at various objects and add them to your cart and pretend like you're checking out. It doesn't actually do anything. Of course, it's it's all just um, just simulated, but that's the website that, that we're hitting. So I'm going to go go to the website URL, and then I'm going to go into my next transaction, and I'm going to select a barista kit. So I'm going to navigate to the specific page for the barista kit, which again would be uh, this home barista kit here. So I'm navigating to that page. Um, and then I'm going to click Add to Cart. So looking at the page, that would be clicking this bluish button here. And you can see we've got a variety of ways to select what button to click. And you can see here we've got options. You know, what, what is the actual action? In this case, we're going to click a button. We saw go to URL. You can see we can do different things, execute some JavaScript, select text, um, switch 
pages, switch tabs. We can do tests. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, but in this case, it's a click. What do we want to click? And then we're going to use XPath. So we can use the ID of the element. If you're familiar with HTML and web programming, um, most elements have an ID and or a name. We can use an XPath, uh, which basically is a way to path, specify the path to the object on the page. Uh, we've got a CSS selector, variety of options here. So in this case, we're basically just going to look for any object that contains the text add to cart. And we're going to assume that there's only one object on the page that has add to cart, and that's the button we want to click. So we're going to locate that. We're going to click it. And then we're going to go into the next transaction, which is completing the order. And the first thing we're going to do is place the order. So get back to my website. When I clicked add to cart, it adds it to the cart. And if I go down to the bottom, I've got a place order button. So I'm going to simulate clicking the button that contains the text place order. And then I'm going to do a test. I want to test and see, did I get the confirmation page back? So I'm going to go ahead and click that so we can see what we should get back. And here's my confirmation page. My order is complete. Great. And so in this case, I'm going to do an assertion. And so down at the bottom, you can see we've got a lot of different assertions that we can do. And basically, this is just saying, I want to assert that this element is present, or I want to assert that this text is present, which is basically just saying, I want to test that it's there, or that this, this situation is true. So you can see I can look for text either being there or not being there. I can look for an element on the page that makes sure that element is there or not there. And I can also look to see, is there an element on the page that's visible? or not visible, depending on what situation. So in this case, I'm going to make sure that there's an element on the page that's present. And that element needs to be an object. Again, could be anything that says your order. Um, so in this case, it's actually finding this blob of text on the page. So as long as I find that, this test will succeed. If it goes to assert that that element is present and it doesn't find it, then the test will fail. I could have done this a variety of ways. I could have just done an assertion for text present. That's a little bit more generic. In this case, I actually said I wanted the text to be in an element. Um, it's just nuances of different ways to do very similar things. So that's that's a multi-step. In this case, we had five steps. Go to the arrow, select, go to the page for the particular object, add it to the cart, place the order, and then test to make sure that I get the confirmation page back. And if we go back to our edit, that's what makes up this test. One last thing to look at is our API tests. So, um, and again, API test, this goes against a REST API. Screen probably looks very familiar to you at this point. It's going to show uh, our metrics and our performance. In this case, it looks like we've got not quite a 100% success rate, but close to it. So there's something that's going on here. Same type of performance metrics and things that we got with our browser-based test. And we can look at individual um, metrics and the film, uh, not a film strip in this case because it's not browser, but we can look at you know the, the time frame, if you will, the timeline of this particular test um, during any run that we want. And let me go back in and I want to go into edit and let's take a look at the step. So the, the other fields here are pretty similar to the ones that we've seen before, not quite as many options because again, we're not simulating a browser, so we don't have screen size and cookies and headers and all those kinds of things to deal with. Um, in this case, again, we're just doing a REST API call. So in this particular one, um, we have multiple steps. Uh, they're not grouped into um, uh, the, the, the transactions in this particular case. And for each step, there's three parts. Um, the setup phase, the request phase, and the validation phase. Many times, you don't need to worry about setup. Um, so if there's something you needed to do, maybe you needed to run some JavaScript, maybe you needed to do it, you know, get something from a previous step. Um, there's a lot of options there, and we'll actually see this down below. The request is actually, what am I doing in this step? So in this case, I'm going to do a post, and this is a real test that actually hits Spotify, and we're going to log into Spotify. So the URL that I need to hit for the REST API is this API token URL. I need to do a post. I'm going to, the body of it has to say grant type client credentials, um, and then it's going to pass in some authorization. Now, in this case, I'm using a variable. So one of the global features that we have with an SSM is this concept of variables. And these variables can be static, in, in which case you know, I've set them up in the tool. I've created a variable called encoded auth. I've set a value to it. 
Um, or in some cases, they're actually extracted as part of one of the steps, and it's a temporary variable in that case. But they're all, they all use this double curly brace method. Um, when you do create a static variable, you can define it as um, private. And if that's the case, once you save it, it can't be viewed again. There's no way to go view it. It's encrypted internally on the back end. Passwords are a great use of that tool. Um, the only thing you can do is change it to, to, to a known value, which of course, again, once you hit submit, it's gone. You, know, you, you can't see what the value is. So it's protected. Users can use that without seeing what the actual value is. So that's what we're doing in this case. So I'm gonna send this post request to API token. I'm gonna to pass in my authentication string and I'm going to validate, again, I'm gonna assert <laughs> um, that I get a response code that equals 200. If I do, I'm then going to extract from the body of the response using JSON syntax. I'm gonna look for a field in the body that comes back called access token. And I'm then going to save it in a custom field called access underscore token. And this is a temporary field. It, it's gone when, the, when the, the test is over. So I can have multiple steps here. So basically this step is going to log me into Spotify and save the access token into this variable. I move on to the step number two. Minimize this, so don't take up too much step. I, nothing's from a setup perspective. So now I'm gonna do a get request to the REST API and I'm gonna do a search. And the query is I'm gonna look for, it's a little hard to read, but I'm, I'm querying for bad and bougie. Um, I'm looking for a track with that name and I only wanna return five at most. No, no payload body because I'm doing a, pay, uh, a get in this request, but you'll see here that I'm passing an authorization header that has bearer and then custom that access token. So I'm using the token that I got back from step one to pass in step two to then authenticate to Spotify and say, hey, you know, I'm Carl Siepel. It's okay, you can, you can do this query. Now in this case, when we get a response back, I'm gonna again assert, make sure that it equals 200, okay. And if it does, I'm also then going to do a JSON extraction from the field body, and I'm looking for tracks, and within that, there's a, an array called items, and I'm going to, the first value of the array, there's a field called ID, I'm going to save that as track ID. Okay, that's step two. We move on to step three, and now we're going to get the actual track. Again, no setup required, my request, I'm going to do an API request to the tracks API, and I'm going to pass in the track ID from step two. And again, I've got to pass my bearer token, so it's, I'm authenticating. And in this case, my validation or the steps that happen when this step is done, I'm al also gonna check, make sure that the response code is 200 okay, because if, if I get an error back, there's no reason to continue. I'm gonna extract from the response body. So this is basically getting me all the information about that track that I found. And some of the information that comes back is a list of the artists of that track. So I'm gonna extract the first and the second artist names and call them artist one and artist two. And then I'm gonna run a little bit of JavaScript. And this JavaScript basically just takes the two names and concatenates them together with the word and in between. So you know, Bob and Sally, um, that's really all it does, but you can be as complex as you want. And then I'm gonna do an assertion. So another test that checks the variable that I've created here. And again, this is creating a variable um, called uh, artists and I'm gonna, um, actually track artist. And I'm gonna to check to see if that track artist equals Migos and Liz Uzi Vert. I don't know how to pronounce the name. So in this case, I'm gonna, it's a made up, it's a contrived example, I get that, but it shows that I can make an API call to a REST API, I can authenticate, I can take information that's returned by that API and use that information in subsequent steps. I can manipulate things, I can extract values that come back from the responses, use those values, actually have some coding in here to do you know, custom things to manipulate the values and things that, that I have before I do the next step. I can do tests for a variety of things. Again, you can see we can do assertions um, and we've got, this is in the body, this is in the response code, or this is the value of the variable. So lots of power, lots of capabilities, lots of things that we can do with these API tests. It's, it's really a very, very robust scripting language uh, available to us. Uh, with that, um, I believe that's everything that I had to cover in the demo. So I'm going to switch back to our slides. We'll make sure we have time for questions here. Um, and David, I'll turn it back over to you. Hi, thanks, Carl. That was awesome. Um, 
the for fantastic demo and very thorough. Uh, so just to go to our, uh, let me advance the slide deck here a little bit. So just before we go into the Q and A, I'd just like to point out a few resources that are available to our audience. So we have our training and certification pages, uh, Splunk Education, uh, Splunk Lantern. We have the documentation available on uh, Splunk Docs. We have e-learning videos, including an SSM demo. We have the .com papers. Um, I like the .com papers because this is usually our latest and greatest content. So if you're looking to see what's kind of coming around the corner, uh, the .com papers can be really insightful. And then we have our blog posts, and our blog posts are from subject matter expertise, subject matter experts within Splunk, um, who will usually focus on a particular area of interest and do a deep dive. So they can be very interesting to read uh, for those of you who are looking for a little bit of a geek out session. Um, and of course, you can try Splunk Observability Cloud free for 14 days. Uh, we have our sandbox, so you can kind of dig around and get your hands uh, on keyboard with Splunk Observability. Next, we'll uh, let's go on to the Q&A. And Carl, I hope you're ready, because I have a number of questions for you. Uh, we've had a really enthusiastic audience. And so I just want to thank everyone who did post a Q&A question. Um, awesome. Looking forward to answering those for you now. So first off, um, what types of multi-transaction options are available? What type of multi-transaction? So hopefully, and I, I don't know how far along in the, in the demo this was asked, but the browser-based tests that we saw are the ones that allow us to have multiple steps. They can be grouped into transactions. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly what, what you were looking for in that particular case, but with the browser-based and the API ones that we just saw at the end of the demo, we've got a full suite of the ability to do multi-step um, capabilities there. So again, with the, just the uptime test, you don't have multiple steps but the other two types of tests, you, you've got that ability. So hopefully I answered your question. If not, let us know and we can dig in deeper. Sure. Um, next up, does the synthetic scripting work with for apps with SAML, SSO, like Okta? Yes. Um, and in fact, um, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. I actually have one of the demos uh, scripts that I set up. Um, and this is the one I was mentioning when we were talking about private locations. Um, that particular customer, their website, it, it's actually a Splunk enterprise um, um, server that we're hitting. Uh, it's protected with SAML, they use Okta. And so the script that I have set up essentially steps through those steps to get authenticated to Okta, um, you know, as, as we kind of saw with the, the steps that we looked at for the um, e-commerce website, as well as the API, we've got the ability to kind of go through those multiple steps. So the first screen was putting in the username, the second screen was putting in the password, and then getting those that, that token back, we save that, we use that for the subsequent steps to then go to the actual website, present the token, and then it recognizes the SAML authentication and, and allows us to log in to the, in this case, the, the Splunk server. So yes, full, full capabilities there. Okay. Um, where does SSM store the user and password for a login? Uh, can be done a couple different ways. Um, let me switch back over. Sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words here. So we can store, you can store them in the script itself. You know, username maybe is not that critical. Um, or you can actually store them, and I say that, uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen. You can store them, as I mentioned, we've got global variables. And so, for example, the one that we were using to authenticate to Spotify um, was this encoded auth. And as I said, once you save it, it's encrypted and you know it's just gibberish at this point. Uh, you know, so I can't see what the value is. But if it's something that you need, and, and they don't have to be encrypted, uh, the, they can be or, or not be. Um, but that, that's you can do it as a global variable. Again, if it's something that's sensitive, I would do it as a global variable and make it um, be, be encrypted so that users can't go in and see what it is. Fantastic, thank you. Um, of course, you know we uh, have a few more questions. Uh, pretty thorough. Um, can the private location reach out rather than having SSM send inbound to the private location? Yes, and I, I realized as soon as the words were out of my mouth that I said it wrong. Um, so the private location, when you start the Docker container up, it actually reaches out to the SSM hosted server and says, hey, I'm private location XYZ. Do you have any jobs waiting for me to run? And then SSM will return those jobs back to the 
to the private location. So no, you do not need to allow inbound access from SSM to your private location. You only need to allow that outbound access. So it, the, the private location, the box running the private location initiates all the, the connections. So my apologies, I, I said it slightly wrong when I, in the demo. No problem, uh, Carl, it's, it's totally understood. Uh, thanks for that clarification. Um, next up, we have a quick question. Uh, does it does it do an S does it do SFTP test types? SFTP, so file transferred. It does not. I cannot think of a way that you would actually simulate doing a file transfer uh, using the FTP protocol. The best uh, we could do it with HTTP. So if we wanted to simulate, for example, downloading a an image or something from a website, we could do that. Um, but using FTP, about the only thing I can think of that we could do there is we could do the basically a port test to test and make sure that the FTP or SFTP port is responding. So that would be um, setting up an uptime test, whoops, uptime test port test. So in this case, I would set it up as the host and then I would use whatever port the SFTP uh, daemon was running on, I could do that. But again, it's it's just going to tell me, is something there and responding or not? OK, thank you, Carl. Um, can we have the alert if uh, x uh, two or more locations fail for y amount of time? So can we specify the number of failures and um, the amount of time they have to be down for in order to trigger the alert? Um, kind of, <laughs> uh, you can specify it's only one, two or three. So I can't say it has to fail five times in a row. I, I, I don't know why there's the limit here, but I can say how many times it has to fail. And, uh, oh, and my apologies. I promised to show this to you with data. So here's one that has data. Um, uh, it, I can't. I don't think we can do a certain number of locations. Um, I can do the split that way. I'm trying to think if we could do a filter. Uh, I mean, I could filter it to a specific location and say that if this location fails, notify me. But I think what, what the person was asking is, can I just have it be a combination of if two or more locations fail within five minutes or something? I can't think of a way, a way to do that off the top of my head, but it, it sounds like a great suggestion, though. OK. Thank you. Um, next up, question. Uh, can we select which browser to use on a browser monitor? Examples, Edge, Chrome, or Firefox? Yes, you can. The, the way that you do that is down here. So this is a, a browser test. This is our, our Buttercup store. And it's you know the, the way that the browser identifies itself to the host or the web server is through the user agent string. And so here I've got, if I turn this off, I can actually specify a custom user agent. So I can simulate that I'm coming from Microsoft Edge or Safari or Chrome or again, you know, mobile devices, things like that. So I've got the ability uh, to do that. You know, when we look at the default one here, it's it's telling the web server that we are a Splunk synthetic, you know, bot, if you will, that's using the Apple WebKit to make the connection. Um, but you have the ability to put any user agent there that you would like. Fantastic. Um, next question up: um, Is there an option to follow a redirect and then test for something on the page? I think the uh, the the question means that can you test? Can you follow the redirect and then? Uh, proceed to do the test on the page that you're redirected to? Um, I have two answers. So yes, you could follow the redirect. You could have that be a step in the script. So if you wanted to, if you expected the redirect and you wanted to test that, hey, when I go to this page, do I get redirected here and then go to that page and you know, do whatever test I want there. Um, to follow a random redirect, um, what you would have to do, yes, you could do it. What you would have to do is basically use the, the, the scripting capabilities that we talked about um, to extract the redirect string and then store that in the temporary variable. And then the next step, you would say, go to that, that URL that, 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 that came from the temporary variable. So yes, it's possible, just a little bit more complicated. Okay. 
Um, can passwords for authorization be automatically rotated? Hmm. Uh, not within the tool itself. Um, if you had something, and, and I'm going to expand on the question, if you had something, an outside system that was managing your passwords, and you needed to update the password that was stored, you know, so for example, if, if we were, you know, hopefully you stored in the global variable. Um, so let's say we needed to update this, whatever the secret is. Um, I'd have to check, there is a REST API access to Splunk Observability Cloud. And so a lot of the things can be scripted or you know accessed or updated through a REST API call to Splunk itself. Um, I don't know if the ability to update a global variable is there yet. Uh, if it's not, I would I would expect that it's, it's being worked on. But we we could certainly look into that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if that's one of the REST APIs that have been opened up yet or not. Though. But that would be the way that, that I would look to do it. Carl, the, the depth of your technical knowledge is astounding. Um, I can tell you spent a lot of time with this product. Um, so it just speaks a lot to the, the value that you know, TechStream brings to their customers. Um, so I am going to steal and answer a question uh, myself. Um, one, of the, one of our attendees uh, asked about rigor um, and some of the features that you showed in the observability suite. Uh, Rigor has been incorporated into the observability suite. And the follow-up question from the attendee asks if um, the Rigor functions will be incorporated into Splunk Enterprise. And uh, the Rigor functions are built into the observability suite, and they're not going to be incorporated directly into Splunk Enterprise. Uh, over time, the products, um, you know, again, forward-looking statements, your mileage may vary. Over time, the project the products are going to merge. Um, but the rigor uh, functionality is baked into the observability suite. Um, so if you have the full observability suite, you get the uh, more updated view that Carl presented today. Um, but it's not a feature that's going to be incorporated directly into Splunk Enterprise um, at the current time. Again, forward-looking statements, uh, mileage may vary. Um, the next question up for you, Carl, is how do you alert yeah, so we, we looked at that a couple of different places. So they're called detectors uh, in Splunk Observability Cloud. So the terminology maybe throw you off a little bit, but when we edit a test uh, and all three tests have this capability down at the bottom, we can create a detector. Uh, so for example, this particular one on the Buttercup store has a detector already created. As we saw, we can specify you know, what, what metric we want to test. Um, again, there's different types of thresholds depending on the metric. I'm not going to get into filtering today set what that threshold is. So in this case, we've said, if the run duration takes longer than 30 seconds, if it happens once by any location, then I want to send a critical alert. In this case, there's no recipients, but I could add, you know, if I wanted to email myself, for example, um, I could say, you know, email me. Um, and, and as I said before, the nice thing is it shows you, in this case, the last four days, I could see if I would had this alert set, um, how many alerts would I have actually gotten? And in this case, it says I would have gotten one. And if, you know, if I set this down to, you know, let's say, 25 seconds, um, you can see my red line. There's a lot of times that it goes above the red line, so I would have gotten alerted almost 500 times in the last four days. So that helps to avoid alert fatigue, you know, where you set up an alert and suddenly you just get flooded with stuff, and you're like, oh, geez, I, I set it too low, or, or I didn't expect that much. You can actually see it here before you click the save button and say, oh, geez, if I hit save, I'm going to get you know, 100 of these a day. Maybe that's not the right threshold. Maybe I need to, to, to pick a different threshold. Or maybe that is the right threshold, and I just have a lot of problems. So a lot of options there. But detectors are how you do alerts in Splunk Observability Cloud. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so the uh, question is about the dashboard demo. Can um, can we list a set of tests in a dashboard for an app and then give access to it in the app team? Can you list a set of tests? So I think I what they're asking is can you, know what that means, but um, I'm guessing can they put a bunch of dashboard. tests into a dashboard and then give the dashboard uh, to an app team? Um, 
you don't have a lot of control over what shows up here other than which metric you're reporting on. So for example, um, you know, the graphs that are here are, are pretty fixed. Um, in terms of access, you would have to give someone access to Splunk Synthetics to be able to see this screen. So yes, <laughs> kind of. Um, in terms of customizing the dashboard, there's not a lot of options, but in terms of giving someone access, yes, you can. You would just you know, set up an account um, you know, under, under, under settings. There's organizational users, users, and you set up the user and all those kinds of things. So I think it's a partial yes answer. Okay. And um, are we able to handle two-factor authentication uh, with SSM? So I assume that's logging into the SSM tool itself, and the answer is yes. So we, we, we saw how we can do that. We talked about how we can do that in a test if the site we're testing uses um, um, something like Okta. Now, it won't work with two-factor, you know, because the you know, SSM can't click the button on my phone to say, yes, it's really me. Um, it can work with SAML and, and third-party authentication sites. To get into SSM, you can set it up to point to your own SAML provider. And if that SAML provider, such as Okta, uses two-factor, then, of course, you'd get the two-factor as well. Um, so for a private location, how many t uh, test scripts can be executed in a single private location? Um, I'm not sure that there is a limit. Um, I've not seen one. If there is, I would suspect it's probably based on the resources of that, uh, you know, the, the, the box that you're running that private location on. So as long as the box can keep up with the load that you're throwing at it, I'm not aware of a limit. Okay. Um, oh, we have an update to that two-factor authentication question that yeah. uh, the previous one you just answered. Uh, the, the clarification is uh, two-factor authentication, not for SSM itself, for the login, but for an app that uses two-factor authentication. Can SSM um, do the login with a two-factor authentication? Yeah. Um, in all likelihood, the answer is probably no, because that second factor is probably something physical that SSM either doesn't have access to or has no ability to, to affect. You know, again, you know, if, it, if it's Okta and it pops up on my phone and you know says accept or decline, a you know, SSM can't do that. It doesn't have access to my phone. Or if it's a, um, you know, the little key fobs that have the rotating number, things like that. Again, SSM is not going to have access to that. Um, so I think the answer is no in that case. Yeah. Okay. Um, almost near the end of our uh, questions, and uh, we're going to, uh, which is great because we're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to preface this next question by saying, uh, you know, we at Splunk and at TechStream are not experts in uh, Cloudflare. We can't predict what another company's product is going to be doing. Um, we can only answer this question with best effort. Um, but on that said, we will we'll give it a go. Um, Carl, do you know that have any insight to this? Are there any surprises with Cloudflare seeing Splunk Synth as a bot? Uh, short answer is no, I don't have any experience with that. So I, I, I can't answer that. I, I don't know if, you know, if Cloudflare is looking at the user agent string or if it's looking at you know the frequency of requests or anything like that to try to make the determination that it's a bot, um, so there there may be some ways to um, reduce or alleviate that. The, if there's a challenge there, there may be some ways around that. Uh, but it, again, I, I honestly don't know the answer. Sure, and I'm going to just add a little to that. Um, I mean, essentially, what we are doing is we are doing an automated activity, which is going to look um, very much like a bot. Uh, it's going to quack a little bit like a bot. Um, and so it, when we use this tool, it's designed for you to look at your internal sites. It's not meant for you to, you know, get tickets on StubHub or um, for a sold out concert or something like that. Um, so the idea behind it is that you would be using it in an environment where you're going to accept or whitelist uh, Splunk Synthetics so that it's not going to trigger any block blocking applications that you have. That said, I can't speak for how Cloudflare builds their product or what limitations they have. But again, I mean, 
you're supposed to be using this on your internal sites and you would be able to whitelist um, you know, Splunk synthetics on your internal applications that may do blocking for suspicious bot, bot activity. Um, so it's something I think that you would want to look at from a configuration perspective with the particular solution that you're using to block bots from your systems. Uh, next step up, um, do API tests have a conditional skip for subsequent steps in case a step fails for some reason? Uh, the question is clarifying, if you're doing API tests and you fail, does the test keep running or does it automatically quit? The concern is um, that the test doesn't keep running and making noise if steps are failing. Yeah, so through these assertions, which you know, can be at, at various steps, um, basically what happens is, is whatever the assertion is, if that assertion fails, so in this case, we've got two, we've got one that says, you know, is the response code 200? And then down later, we had another one that says, you know, is the value of this variable equal to this string? If the assertion fails, the test stops. So there's not a conditional, you know, jump over the next step or branching logic or anything like that. Um, so that run of the test will stop and it, it'll, it will be indicated as a failure. The next time it's scheduled to run, it's going to pick back up and run again. So if you've got it set to run every five minutes, it's going to keep running every five minutes, even if it's returning a failure every single time. So um, there, there's nothing that really lets you say, hey, if I get a failure, stop running the sequence of tests. The only thing is it just stops running that test you know, doesn't do the, the, any steps that are after the one that failed. So it's uh, kind of rudimentary, but but hopefully it gives you enough to be, to be able to do the, the, the multi-step stuff. Okay. And we do have a comment from our um, our studio audience here regarding the, uh, the bot conversation. Uh, one of our participants, and again, this is coming from a participant. We haven't taken the time to verify it. Um, they're saying that it looks like Cloudflare has Splunk in the good bot list. Uh, if that's true, that would be great to know. Um, and thank you for uh, sharing that. But you know, obviously, please feel free to go verify that on your own. And then one last question, um, and then we're out of time. Uh, can we run a batch script to capture the two-factor authentication token and pass it to the script? Can we run a script? So within the tool, I, and I'm not sure exactly what, what he meant by, or he or she meant by script, and we do have the ability to do some manipulation of things within the tool. I don't know how you would capture like a two-factor authentication. You know, I'm thinking of the, the little you know key fob things that have the rotating numbers. I don't know how you would capture that with a script because you literally. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's the, security vulnerability in the app that the app or physical token. If you could capture it, then it'd be potentially able to you know spy on the token and just automatically update the numbers every time that's changed. Um, seems like it would be a yeah. problem um, for the provider of the tokens as much as it could be useful for you know testing purposes. David, I, I think that might have been the last question. I did have two more things I wanted to do. I know we're a minute or two over time. One real quick, I promised to talk about Selenium. If you do Selenium scripts, can I import those scripts into SSM? Uh, Yes and no. Um, SSM is going through a transformation. It used to be Rigor, as, as David talked about. If you're a customer that's been using it and you're on the old interface, the old Rigor interface, you do have the ability to import a, 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 synth, a Selenium script. The new interface, which is what I'm showing you here, that's fully integrated into Observability Cloud, that's not there yet. It is being worked on, um, and I believe it should be out in the next few months. Don't hold me to that, but that's what I've been told. Um, the second thing I wanted to just pass along to everyone is there are integration points between SSM and other tools. For example, you know, in Splunk Enterprise, you know, maybe I want to do a search that query reaches into SSM and you know shows me some of these graphs and things, the dashboards and, and you know, metrics and stuff. There is a, uh, a Splunk-based app um, from, uh, that you can download and install that into Splunk Enterprise or Splunk Cloud that allows you to hook that to SSM and be able to retrieve and query the data from SSM, from within inside of Splunk Enterprise. And there's also a similar capability for ITSI. So I think I saw a question fly by about, can we view this information in ITSI? Yes, there are, are some apps and some integration points there. So thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, that's great. Um, we're going to have to move on. We'll answer a couple of 
questions that just came in offline just to, in the interest of time we need to uh, wrap up so i would like to encourage everyone to, if you haven't been there to check out community.splunk.com we have wide um, splunk community and the very active and invested splunk community and it's really interesting when you can go on uh, our community site and you can see other users who are trying to do many of the things that you're trying to do as a customer today and you can see the approaches that they've had where they've been successful it's also great for mining ideas of how you can use Splunk Enterprise and Splunk Observability to solve problems that you're running into in your own organization, as well as workarounds and hacks um, to be able to, um, and different tips and tricks and be able to see what's worked for other folks and what could possibly be working for you. The thing that I find most interesting about our community site is just the different ways that uh, our Splunk community have applied our technology to be able to solve their business problems within their own organizations. Um, you know, just the collective imagination of our community is fantastic and it's much more uh, exhaustive than what, you know, what we can come up with internally. Um, thank you to everyone who answered, asked questions. Uh, your participation made this session so much more interactive and interesting. And I'd like to say thank you to Carl and Techstream for jumping on and providing us with their subject matter expertise. Uh, to Carl, you got some really good questions there, some really deep technical ones. I love it. Um, your ability to handle um, just the wide variety and kind of some things that went off in left field. Um, it's very impressive and thank you, sir. Thank you, David, appreciate it. And thanks for everybody as well. Uh, and with that, thank you to all of our participants. Um, we'll follow up with the couple remaining questions that came in at the last minute uh, offline. Thank you and have a great day.